Okay, announcements. Wednesday, 7 p.m., music practice. Uh, Pastor wants to remind us that the five love language classes are going to be coming soon. Uh, praises. We're praising God's little sister and her family uh, arrived and left. Alex and Mike got home safe. Uh, let's be in prayer for the people that are up in Atlanta, that hearts will be moved and that uh, they'll have a good, safe time up there. Prayer request, uh, Richard Cook, Scott, Bob, Diane, Stan Thornton, uh, of course the Atlanta team up there, JD, Vicki Childers, Josh, Andy's mom, Ellen, First Baptist Church, Bob, firemen and first responders in the community. They're just getting drug out. Um, we have one more to add, James Sumter family. Uh, evidently he was up in the hills and uh, has passed. And so uh, they finally found him up there, but uh, we need to be in prayer for the James Sumter family. Uh, Ellen, you had something? Okay, so the Melody Clark family. Do we know where they're from? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so... Suicide is never a way out. as a church have been supporting suicide awareness and prevention and there's no excuse. I mean, you have a church family besides your regular family. If anybody is feeling that way, grab any one of us and I'm sure that we'd be able to uh, sit down and take a moment and pray with you and, and help you express those disappointments or griefs or whatever may be drawing you into that type of a situation. So we just uh, do remember the family. Any other prayer request? Sarah. Yep, school is starting up, so be in prayer for the students and the teachers. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. I mean. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. Do we have any other prayer requests this morning? Bonnie.
And what's Mike's last name? Was it? Mike Malloy. Okay. And he's currently in Idaho Falls. Yeah. Okay. 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 Anything else? Okay. Ministry opportunities. We've got a big list of them there. Samaritan. First, Boise Rescue Mission, Blessing Bags, VBS, went well this year, I think, and looking forward to next year, and Fall Kids Club, it's going to be coming up soon, I think in the middle of September, was last I heard, so if you feel inclined to help out with that, they'd certainly appreciate your help, Women's Devotion, Women's Retreats, any anniversaries this week? Any birthdays coming up this week? No anniversaries and no birthdays, huh? <laughs> You've been there one year already? Wow. And they still put up with you, huh? Right. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for allowing us into your home to worship you, dear Lord. We just ask that you uh, be with these prayer requests and, you know, each situation and what's needed. Especially be with our Atlanta folks as they're preparing to come home, give them safe travels. We just ask that you be with those that are in need this morning for whatever reason they may have, unable to be here. Dear Lord, we, we miss them when they're gone. We just ask that you uh, be with uh, uh, Pastor and Joe, especially at this time, as, you know, that's a tough time for them. We just ask that you uh, be with the Cox family and... They started off the trip uh -uh, kind of on the sick side, so we just ask for your healing touch on them and and uh, be with Sandy. I know she's got an issue coming up she's going to have to deal with. and we, We're such a needy crowd, dear Lord. We just thank you that we can go before the throne and turn it all over to you and that you will intercede in our behalf. We ask that you be with... Uh, Paul this morning and fill him with your Holy Spirit, guide him and direct him as he brings the morning message. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Kids are dismissed. If we have you're taking okay, the littles can go in the nursery and the middle school? No. Okay. <laughs> I can barely get off the pulp. The little light came on. Does that mean it's working? The light, yeah, it's green. So, must be in business. <laughs> I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. That's the way the psalmist starts with Psalm 122. And I can't think of a better place to be on a Sunday morning than in here with all you guys. Um, praising God and in songs, even though we're not really used to hymn books. <laughs> That's where the good hymns are, though. You don't get good hymns in choruses, because they're choruses, right? So we sing with praises, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving grace to the Lord. And that's uh, first, uh, Colossians 3.16. And whatsoever that hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. So you shouldn't be you know, recorded loud to be played loud. I mean, you should be in the, in the congregation putting your whole heart into singing, because it's really cool. So... <laughs> 
I'm glad that anyone's here this morning. Also because uh, last year when I filled in on Atlanta Sunday, it was like Ed and Brenda and me and Sarah. And it didn't seem like many other people showed up, so we're glad a few showed up. So I call this one Atlanta Sunday because of that. I previously had a different title. And I'm like, oh, i got to fix that. That'll never do. <laughs> and it will look like I'm reading this because I probably will be because it's uh, I, what I did. I got New King James out of Bible Gateway and I stuck it in on paper with the hope of not fumbling and looking sillier than I will look anyway. So, or <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I was told there were youngsters in here, and I guess they all escaped. But at any rate, are you guys youngsters still? Some of you might fall into the category, or, <laughs> or maybe you're young again. At any rate, uh, we're talking about David and Goliath this morning. And that's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. But before we start that, you need a little bit of background information. Because the story really starts about 65 to 70 years before chapter 17. 17 of 1 Samuel. And it starts with a lady called Hannah. Now most of you have heard of Hannah because I think she gets preached on nearly every Mother's Day. <laughs> and she was this woman of great faith. And she prayed for a son. And she prayed for a man-child, it put, it, the old King James says. And she poured her heart out to God. And she poured out all over the place and let God put it back together again and she went back away from that place and she no more was sorrowful but she started eating and then God gave her the son and she promised God if you give me this man child I will lend him back to you for all of his life and he'll be a Nazarite from his birth for all of his life, but he's going to lend him. You know, if you lend something, unless you lend it to a preacher, don't, don't ever do that. I'm a preacher's kid. We have all kinds of stuff for our house. I don't know who gave them to us, you know? <laughs> so be careful. <laughs> if you lend something to someone, you expect to get it back. And my point here is, Hannah was not thinking in terms of today, the 70 years or 80 or 90 that you actually live on planet Earth. She was thinking eternally. She was expecting to get Samuel back. And she has. She's had him back for like 3,000 years. And they've been fellowshipping in heaven with the Lord for 3,000 years. She was thinking beyond today. And then nobody says much about Elkanah. Now there's Camp Elkanah just out of La Grande, Oregon. That's a part of the Blue Mountain Association. But who's this Elkanah fellow? Well, it's just her husband. And in Levitical law, if your wife or daughter made a vow and you thought it was a stupid one and it's going to really conflict with what we want to do, you had the obligation and right as, a, as the dad to annul it. And Elkanah does not do that. This is going to be his firstborn son from this lady and he does not annul it. In fact... They're going up to the temple, and she had promised to take the boy up to the temple and give him to Eli to minister. And she said, no, not until I've weaned him. And Elkanah says to her, make sure you keep the promise you made to God. So not only did he not annul the promise, he made sure that she kept it. Elkanah should get some points for that, because this is a big sacrifice for him also. Well, Samuel lived for quite a while, and he got a little old. And during this time, he was judge of Israel, he was the prophet of Israel, and he was the high priest of Israel. He had these three hats that he wore well, and he did a splendid job. He was there when there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the whole nation of Israel came back to God. He was there. He was part of that. He led them to victory in battle. But he got old. This happens. I noticed the other day in the mirror, there's just some funny looking guy looking back at me instead of that fine, red-headed, handsome fellow that used to look back at me. And I don't know where he went. I keep thinking, it's my dad in there. And who put him in my mirror? But, so Samuel had two sons, Joel and Abiah. 
and they weren't following the Lord at all. They were taking bribes and perverting justice. So the people said, give us a king. We're done with this judge program. It's not working. We want a king. So Samuel and the Lord had a pretty good com conversation, a long one. And so eventually God says, give them what they want. Give them a king. So, so God brings Saul to Samuel. And Samuel says, you're going to be king. He's head and shoulders taller than everybody else. You know, one of these guys. He looks, looks a lot like Riley. Where'd Riley go? <laughs> head and shoulders taller than everybody else. You know, the guy you vote for, for, for homecoming king. <laughs> Did he have a homecoming king? We always had a homecoming coming queen. This is an American tradition I never have understood. <laughs> I don't even know where they came home from. You know, they were always here. It's always at your home team. So I, I don't know. Anyway, this is the guy you want to look at. And he was a donkey wrangler, and he couldn't find his donkeys. And he goes around, and he spend all kinds of time looking for these donkeys. He can't find them. Finally, his servant who is with him says to him, he gives him direction and stuff. And I'm going like, shouldn't this guy, if he's going to be a good leader and a good king, shouldn't he be the one giving direction? Shouldn't he be the one with the little extra in his pocket so he could do something? So the servant said, hey, how about we go and see Samuel? Samuel might be able to tell us where they are. And Saul's like, who's Samuel? He's not in, he's not really with it. And so, well, can we give him if we go? Well, the servant says, I've got a chunk of money here, and I'll chuck that into the game, and we can, we can do it that way. And the long story short is, Samuel already knew the donkeys have been found, and that you're going to be king. Saul anoint, uh, Samuel anoints Saul king, and he becomes king. But he doesn't do a very good job. He doesn't obey God. He doesn't get on with it. He likes to sit under tabernacle trees and absorb the cool. His son, who would Jonathan, when he attacked the garrison of the Philistines, had to be approximately 15. And his son went and attacked the garrison of the Philistines while he was sitting in camp, drinking tall, cool whatevers, I guess. You know, he wasn't really the leader that you would think he should be. And he kept disobeying God and disobeying God to the point where Samuel says, God has rent the kingdom out of your hand and you're no longer going to be king. It takes a while. In fact, uh, Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister of Israel after they became a nation, said hardest part whether they were was to transfer power from one to another as you go through so it takes a while for these things to happen and God disqualified Saul and it was so bad in fact that when God said I want you to go to Jesse in Bethlehem he's got eight sons and I'm going to pick one of them but I'm not telling you who it is till you get there and so Samuel says to God, well, yeah, but I'm not going because so Saul sees me going, he's going to kill me. This is how bad Saul had become. He was stuck on himself and he wasn't doing a good job and he knew the kingdom was taken out of his hands, but he wasn't giving up. Saul could have repented, something we might need to do every once in a while. He could have quit and gone back to donkey wrangling. He could have done a lot of things, but his pride had got a hold of him, and he wasn't going to let go no matter what. So, so, so God says, take a heifer and have a sacrifice, and that'll cover up your true mission, and you'll go up there. So he does that, and he anoints. Eliab comes in. He's the oldest. He's a big guy, good-looking dude. And God says, nah. Not that one. Then the next one, not that one. Because there's seven of these dudes. And it's not any of them. And Samuel says to Jesse, don't you have another kid somewhere? Oh, yeah, we got the run to the litter. He's out there taking care of sheep. Well, bring him in. Hurry up. And that's the one. And God says, get up and anoint him. For God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. Yeah. And so Saul anointed him king. And he's probably a redhead, by the way. He was, a, <laughs> he 
it was ruddy complexion, it says, which possibly is true as far as the redhead part, and it possibly came because in his lineage was Rahab the harlot and Ruth from Moab, and everyone knew Ruth was in town because they had noticed her, and who would you notice more than a bright redhead in a bunch of people with black hair? And Rahab may well have been picked out for her job, in, and there's lots of talk about what that really meant, because she might also have been a redhead. So they put the two together, and that's probably why he was so good looking. <laughs> So he was a skilled musician, we know this, and he was accounted as a warrior, even as a young feller. He was brave, tough, and caring. He was a shepherd, not just a boss, like you would be with a horse or a donkey or something, but one who protected and cared for his sheep. So that's the introduction part. This is just some background information. So this chapter 17, I hope, will make a bit more sense. It starts out like this. Now the Philistines versus Philistines, this is a different tribe. The, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soto, which belongs to Judah. And that's like uh, Sand Hollow, Idaho, Socho, Judah. They encamped between Socho and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And if you look in the maps on the ba in the back of your Bible, you still won't have a clue where any of this stuff is because they're so bad. So you'll have to get a real one. And in fact, some of the places that are mentioned in the Bible don't even turn up on maps anymore because there's been so much civil war and all kinds of war there. You can't even find Ziklag anymore. I looked it up once on Google Earth and it went and put a pin there, but there's nothing there. So I don't know. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Well, if you have a nice big valley between you and you're all lined up there like a western, <laughs> you don't have to fight anybody. It's a pretty cool way of doing it. Now we're having a nice great camping trip out here. <laughs> I hope they brought some good grub, you know. <laughs> And the Philistines stood on the mountain, and then and the champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Wow. I don't know. What's a cubit, right? He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And that's not like the male mail. It's like... Uh, chunks of metal. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he, had a bron and he had bronze armor on his legs, because that's the only place normal sized people could get him. And a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. All right, now we've got to break this up just a whole bunch because I don't know what a shekel is. Do you know what a shekel is? I don't know what a shekel is. So, I, well, first of all, the height business. Most of your Bibles in the footnotes say nine foot nine plus or minus. But there's a fellow, Bishop Cumberland, and he says it was a scriptural cubit was greater than 21 inches, which makes him 11 foot four. Even more formidable looking, right? So I'm going with that one, because it also, there's, there's quite a few skeletons they found in the area, and they're 10 to 12 feet tall. So I'm going with, yeah, probably he was the big feller, because he's got some brothers, which we'll talk about in a minute, and maybe they picked him out because he was the biggest. So then I thought of all this poundage and shekelly things, and I thought, well, I could go through here and work this out, but I wonder if somebody else already did. So I got lucky, and I looked in my message by Eugene Peterson, and good old Eugene helped me out, and it, it, it reads like this. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor, 126 pounds of it. Okay, so that helped me out. I could do that, 126 pounds. That's uh, like one and a half times Martha. <laughs> <laughs> his, and his spear 
I didn't know how much, how big, how big's a weaver's loom, you know, because a lot of this stuff was cottage industries. They had them in their front room. They made their own cloth or what have you. Well, that's not going to be that big. But Sir Eugene puts it, his spear was like a fence rail. Now, out west here, we know what a fence rail looks like. We know how big they are. And that one kind of spoke to my heart. He had a fence rail with a 15-pound tip on it, and he was going to throw that at people. And that would really hurt, but probably not for very long. Then he, Goliath, stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come up to li- out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are the mere servants of Saul? Yeah, this guy's like full of it, man. <laughs> Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine kept going and he said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. you got this 12-foot dude out there yelling obscenities at you. You're going to be intimidated, right? And he didn't just say that stuff. He said some more stuff. And that came out in Matthew Henry's commentary, who says that in the Chaldee paraphrase, which is an extra extra biblical text, which I only just came about knowing that it existed. It says that he boasted that he killed both Hophni and Phinehas, which were the sons of Eli, and captured the Ark of the Covenant. It's like four chapters back. So he boasted that he had done that. And you really going to mess with me? Well, actually they weren't. They were running away. You know? and, I, and right here, I'm going to do a little bit of a Dallas detour on you. <laughs> Because I want this to last an appropriate length of time, like one or two hours should do it. (laughs) Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour or destroy. And what the deal is with that, I have been told, and I haven't verified this for myself, but when a lion gets old in Africa, he can't hunt like he used to. And I get that one. We don't go up hills as quickly as we used to. You have to stop and breathe and do things like that that you don't have to do when you're a kid. So supposedly, the old lion, he gets out there and he roars. And that roar can be heard miles away, I'm told. And, it, and the real hunters go out and watch and see what he stirs up. And then they go and have lunch and dinner and what have you. And the gazelles are very happy to give up a few to keep the peace, right? So that's what Satan does. And that's what he's doing in this text. And Samuel also had to be cautioned by God. And we already, I already used this one a little bit. But when he's picking out... Jesse's son to anoint as king, God says to him, do not look at his appearance, because he'd already done that with Saul. And Saul didn't turn out at all. And now in Matthew chapter 14, beginning of verse 25, it goes like this. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them. Them being the apostles, they're in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And it's rough out there. Things aren't going super well. You know, if you're on a little dinghy out in the middle of the river, or a lake, or in this case, the Sea of Galilee, it can get pretty, you know, you're puckering up pretty badly. And Jesus went out to them walking on the sea, or the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. I'd say that too. And they cried out for fear. <laughs> some dude's walking across, you know, we're bouncing around in a boat. Some, I, I would probably not like that. And Peter answered him and said, well, just back up, I missed a verse, sorry. And immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. All through the scriptures you get fear not, only believe. When the angel talked to, when Gabriel talked to Mary, he says, fear not, only believe, or believe only. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Fear not, thou, fear not, not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, is Isaiah 41.10. I will help thee, I will keep thee, I will take care of you. Fear not, only believe. David gets that. 
And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Eleven others stayed in the boat. Peter's the only one that got out. And Jesus said, come. And Jesus says, come to us today. Do you know Jesus? Is he your savior? He says, come. Come unto me, all you heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you need something, come to Jesus. He will give it to you. He will help you. He will carry you through. He will not make the stuff go away. He'll carry you through. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Pretty exciting, huh? But Peter got his eyes off the goal, as we all tend to do from time to time. When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Didn't Jesus just tell him not to be afraid? And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, you get that? Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And God says that to us all the time because we always doubt. I do day after day after day. He has immense patience. And when they, Jesus and Peter, got into the boat, the wind ceased. Isn't that interesting? Okay, picking up back at 1 Samuel 17, verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man was old. I thought of some smart aleck comments to say there, but I think I better not. <laughs> Advanced in years in the days of Saul, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three oldest sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. Of, he's the eighth son. And there's at least two sisters because Joab, Abishai, and Azahel were the sons of Zeruiah. And I always thought that was a dad, but that's David's sister, Zeruiah. She must have been one powerful woman. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So the three eldest are out of battle. David's been playing his harp to help out Saul because he had a mental issue. <laughs> And from time to time, he went back to Bethlehem to help his dad. Well, while Saul's off at battle and David's not included in that, it makes sense that he would be in Bethlehem with his dad. And the Philistine, Goliath, drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. This 40 days business turns up in the Bible. Moses was 40 years in Midian getting ready to lead the children of Israel. He was 40 days on Mount Sinai talking to God. And the children of Israel were 40 years in the wilderness because they disobeyed God and wouldn't go up into the land because they were giants. The same tribe as are now going to, David's going to, you know, if we hurry up, David's going to take him out, right? And Elijah was 40 days and nights in the power of the food given to him by the angel when he went to Mount Horeb after fleeing from Jezebel. I want some of that. I mean, that's better than those, uh, when, back when we were kids, yeah, we were all about the same age, except for Justin, he's young. <laughs> we had, when they first went to the moon, they had those, well, these space sticks or something, and they were supposed to make you run higher and jump further or something. I mean, that's, maybe that's the tennis shoes. And then Jesus, Jesus was 40 days and nights being tempted in the wilderness. And Jesus was 40 days teaching and encouraging the disciples after he had ascended. And he was taught to them about the kingdom of God. That's in Acts 1-3 if you want to check me out. So then Jesse, he's an old guy. And I have noticed, it's starting to happen to me. That as we get older, the little things in life bother us uh, way more than they did when we were young. So Jesse's kind of worried about these three oldest sons. And he says 
to David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. It does say run. So anyway, I figured that's what he meant. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news for them. I want to know what's going on. I haven't heard heard anything. There's been no good or bad news. Nothing's happening. What's the deal? So David rose early in the morning, and one translation said, at the crack of dawn. That's the best time of the day. If you get up, the crack of dawn, you see that light just right across the valley. And you see the mountains start to glow as the light comes behind it. That's my favorite time of day. And it's like the air's fresh, and there's no one else around much, you know. I get the day to myself. I'm there. Nobody else is. Yeah, that's my time of the day. It's a good time to go hunting, too. And he left the sheep with a keeper and took the things that his dad wanted him to take, that his dad commanded him, it says here. Now, there's no mention of a donkey in this instance, and it's kind of interesting because in chapter 16, when he went to see Saul, he got a donkey. I think he got derated. <laughs> You know, you like to get upgraded? Well, he got downgraded. Because if there is no donkey mentioned, chances are there isn't one. Except for in the King James Version, it's kind of it, it's confusing language. And it says he left his carriage with the keeper instead of just his stuff with the keeper. So you think, well, maybe there's a horse pulling the carriage. Either way, uh, no donkey that I could find of. So that means he backpacked it. I'll go, all right, now, is that really true? I mean, this sounds like a lot of stuff, and how do you get it all in there? So I did some estimating and a little bit of guesstimating. That backpack weighed 86 pounds. And that's before, I didn't have a weight for the thing, whatever container the effort of grain was in. And I didn't have, uh, you know, I just made some good guesses on the cheese. And he, I don't know how much the stuff he was carrying for his own stuff weighed. But we're looking right around 86 pounds. And this guy's a still a runt. He's a little guy. And it says so later. They call him, uh, that's how do you put it? He put it, uh, uh, this, this stripling. That's what, that's what Saul calls him, this stripling little guy. One tough little hombre. You ever seen these little guys? You think, oh yeah, you're, you look like a piece of beef jerky, don't you? Rawhide and muscle. There's no, no one's messing with those guys. There was a policeman in Klamath Falls, and he was one of those guys. I was in the fire department. And they'd come by and hang out with us some. And I don't remember the name, but the guy actually had to quit and went to become an attorney because some guys got out of the car and started touching off rounds at him. And he shot where the guy should have been. If he had been where he had been, uh, he would have taking care of the guy. It would have been like the Israelites say, in, uh, if you're looking at uh, the, the war going, the threat was eliminated. <laughs> I think that would have happened. You don't mess with a little wiry guy because they aren't something to mess with. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. Because they make a lot of noise back then because you try to freak out the other guys, right? The guy with the most noise wins. Anyway, they probably had a bumper sticker. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. He wanted to know what's going on with his brothers too. It was a good family. Then as he talked with them, there was this champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, heard the words. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Kind of like one of those Monty Python things. Run away! Run away! <laughs> I'm not even going to admit that I actually watched that. But anyway. <laughs> so the men of Israel... It took me four tries. I kept falling asleep. <laughs> So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. Was sounding good. Will give him his daughter. That might not be good. That's not always a good thing. And give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. And that is a good thing. I pay a lot of taxes. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this unsurprising? circumcised still a sign that he should defy the armies of the living God. Now we see who they're really fighting against. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Oh. Now Eliab, his older brother, everyone has an older brother, I have an older sister, but you know, 
It works. Now Eliab had a, his oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? The few sheep probably were special. It's in Haley's Bible handbook. Those probably were special sheep for Passover, as it turns out. But at any rate, it's his brother going, <laughs> Right? Why did you come down here and with whom you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Yeah, but I haven't seen one yet. You guys are all sitting here running away. He doesn't say that. He practices Proverbs 15.1. Proverbs 15.1 says, what does it say? A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger something to remember when you're negotiating with a contractor, I learned. <laughs> the, the change order got less if you didn't fight with them. So you, <laughs> and he says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Eliab's probably feeling a little guilty. He didn't go down there and fight that Philistine. He didn't do anything. He ran away like everybody else. He's probably chagrined, I believe is the term. Then David turned from Eliab toward another and said the same thing. And these people answer him as the first ones did. Sounding pretty good. And when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him because of this guy. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. Oh. And here we get somebody else looking on the outward appearance. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a youth. And am he a man of war from his youth? You can't do this. None of the rest of us can, so you surely can't. Oh, this is a David, though. Oh, this kid. I mean, I just love this guy. He's a hero if there was ever a hero in the whole wide world. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth and when it arose against me I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. And see, he's little these scars up my arms. That happened then. Yeah. He might have a few scratches on his back too because as far as, you know, even if a house cat when it's all twi twisted up on you it's pretty formidable. I don't like them one bit when they're upset. You know, they your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Not he might, not I think he will, but he will. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Best thing he said to him ever. And this is kind of funny, this next bit. So Saul clothed David with his armor. Have you ever gone into the attic and found a trunk? And it's got old clothes in it. When you were a kid, we had one of those. And we dress up, right? And we have these clothes on that were like five times too big. Well, remember David's a stripling? Saul's head and shoulders taller than everybody else. And Saul clothed David with his armor. <laughs> I mean, he's going to look like dress up, right? And he put a bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with his coat of mail. David fastened his sword into his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't go with this lot. Get them off. Take them off. I have not tested them. So David took them off. And as you look at this, you'll see that Goliath is bristling with defensive stuff and weapons. You know, he's kind of like a transformer. If you ever watched those movies, the Transformers, my kids loved them. And, you know, they had, like, they click down, they got a machine gun, and they had, like, a saw blade, cut a guy out of a car. You know, this is what I, this, the Goliath, the, the 3,000 years ago Transformer. This guy has got all this stuff. Half of what he's carrying, at least, is defensive weapons. David didn't have any defensive weapons, none. 
All he had was a stick, a staff, which I'm not sure why he took that, and the sling. They're offensive weapons. He took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five. That's just a prime number, not divisible by anything but one and itself. Five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand. Now I imagine this sling is like a baseball mitt. When we came to this country, I couldn't play baseball. I had no clue. They had this bat and a sing and oh, he's three strikes, you're out, okay, got that. And then so if you don't like what they throw at you, you don't have to strike at it. And I still got called with strike. Well, I didn't like that one, so I didn't strike at it. No, it was in the strike zone. What strike zone? You know, <laughs> I don't know anything about this. And then I didn't have a mitt. You know, we, were, we had a suitcase each, right? We didn't have mitts. We didn't have any of this stuff. So sometimes you get a mitt and someone will loan it kindly. And it's like... And then get another one. It's all oiled up and it's just right. And you can fairly near grab a 10 feet above your head and it would like suck that ball in and you catch it. I imagine this sling's been well oiled. When he was out there watching those sheep, taking care of those sheep, he put a little lanolin from the sheep on that baby. And I bet this thing just curved around that boat, that rock and he'd fling it. Yeah, I got this just right. I bet that thing was just like an extension of his arm. I, I did some framing for a while and that hammer just becomes an extension of your arm and you just don't need those stupid little gun things that's for girls anyway <laughs> I imagine this sling is just like that all oiled up and well used and he drew near the Philistine oh yeah well the other people are running the other way not David he's going towards the problem when you're rafting on, a, on, on white water you take your be the, the, the front of your boat and you stick it straight in to the middle of the biggest wave and you roll like crazy and that's when you can achieve your goal. If you go sideways, you're flipping over. If you go backwards, you don't get enough oomph to go through it. You go upside down this way. That's how life has to be taken. You take it head on and you go for it. And he drew near the Philistines. Now, five. We've got to get, get this cleaned up here. David had five stones. Did he have a lack of faith? No. Goliath had four kinfolk one was called Ishi Benob. The other one's called Saf. The other one's called the brother of Goliath. And there's another fellow with six fingers and toes, which also was a son of the giant. So there's five of these. And in time, at least three of these guys were killed by David and his family. So it's kind of interesting. So I kind of think, well, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Whet your appetite. <laughs> So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. Which is interesting, because when you think about it, you got this fellow with a big shield, and then David, Saul, uh, Goliath, that guy, he's going to be behind him a little bit, so you're going to have to get your trajectory just right to get over the shield and in to about the only place where he wasn't, didn't have any defense, which is right here. Because he didn't put his visor down. Because he didn't think he needed to. Stupid man. <laughs> So David had to get this just right. This is a tricky shot at best. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And, the and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. Red and good-looking. See, I told you. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks and the Philistine cursed David by his gods little g there is only one God and that's Yahweh the Philistine said to David come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field one David sandwich on rye coming right up no silly man then David said to the Philistine you come to me with a sword a spear and with a javelin but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Yeah. David didn't have any defensive weapons. He just had God. 
And that's all any of us need. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. <laughs> this is not a very nice little guy, is he? He may be a little stripling, but he's pretty... <laughs> and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that's what's happening right now today in Israel. That all his assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Now these battles are probably a little easier to fight than the ones that are internal, the ones that are more subtle, the ones that have the undercurrent that you can't quite get your finger on. But the same thing works. God is still in charge and he still is. It's, the battle is still his. So it was when the Philistine arose and came near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his head, forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. And I wonder if that earth didn't shake when he hit. Because I thought about this, you know. I'm 200 pounds. So this guy is twice my size. He's at least 400, but he's this much wider. I bet he is six, seven, eight hundred pounds. And with all that armor and junk on, you cut him up for cordwood. Anyway. <laughs> so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out and, of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. <laughs> Used his own sword to cut his head off. And I always I wondered then, how, how much does a head weigh? <laughs> Sorry. So I looked it up and uh, Googled it and it says 5 to 11 pounds, depending. So this guy's Bigger, so 20 pounds. And when the Philistines, it comes in because I have a friend, his name's Steve George, and we went hunting in Colorado, right? And it's far away, he's way over there, we all have 10 power binoculars because that's what it takes to see anybody. And he shot, finally shot the deer that I should have shot, but I didn't get the job done, he did. And he puts his rifle over his head and he stands like this, and we put that on our little map every time we got one. <laughs> so, I think David cut that head off and he held that up. For everyone to see, there's no doubt this dude's gone down. He's gone. I whacked him. He's never coming back. But that might got a little heavy after a while. I don't know if he took the helmet off first and just held it by the hair or how he did it. But, you know, that's quite a big head. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted. Oh yeah, they did. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the Israelites chased right after them. And they left them dead all the way from the gates, from the entrance of the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharim. That has to be right because I said it. Even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. And I reckon that's quite a trophy. And I wondered, because I do this sort of thing, when he finally built his, t his palace, if he didn't have a hole with all this armor in it, Ishbi, Benob, Goliath, the brother of Goliath, the guy with six fingers and six toes, have a whole row of these guys, then you could jack him up a little taller so it looked even bigger. You know, you could, you could do stuff like that. Because when you get, a, you get a deer or something, you kind of get the head mounted and you put it in the most efficient light, right? To make it look like you got the biggest one you did. So <laughs> I reckon that that might have been quite a little thing to you know, bring, the, bring the guys in from the neighboring countries and walk them past all that. So yeah, we killed all them, you're next. <laughs> so be, behave. So, when Saul and saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? He should have known. He's been playing the, the, the singing for him, making him happy. And I think there was maybe a little bit in this. And I just wonder if Saul hadn't picked up a little bit of a rumor here and there because 
Samuel told him the kingdom's going to a neighbor that's better than you. And I just think maybe that's why he dressed him in all that armor. And maybe that's why he's asking these questions right now. Then as David returned from the slaughter, Abner took him and brought him before Saul and with the head of the Philistine in his hand. He's probably saying, don't drip on my carpet. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Whose son are you? Whose daughter are you? In conclusion, the part you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Obey God. If he's given you something to do, get on with it. Do it. Keep your eyes firmly affixed on the Savior. Don't let the things of this world bother you. Look straight ahead. My youngest son, I was, he, he was running. He is a sophomore in high school, and he won the state championship in Oregon for cross country. And there was this, I, I, the, he was so small, and I have some slides, and I thought to bring them, but I decided not to. I thought he was going to get trampled. I thought, there's no way this kid's even going to live. He won. And the reason he won, there was a big fellow there from Kenya who got freaked out because Tim was right behind him. Tim didn't, didn't, didn't lead one foot in that race. But he kept his eye on the goal. And the guy from Kenya kept looking back at Tim. And I watched the video. Every time he looked at Tim, he lost the pace. Tim won that race by four thousandths of a second. Wow. And they had a finish and then they got the little red lines. I have that picture. It's one of my favorite ever. He kept his eye on the goal. What's your goal? Is your eye on that goal? Last week I was sitting here listening to Dallas and I realized that I have not been living for Jesus the way I want to, the way I need to, the way I should. So this week I've had some behavior modifications and the Holy Spirit got a hold of me a little bit. Is your eye on Jesus? Is your eye on Him? Keep your eyes firmly affixed on the Savior and exercise your shield of faith. Believe. Fear not. Only believe. Let's bow in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for David and the testimony he had that we can still look at and read about and enjoy and understand. Thank you, Lord, you gave him such great faith. And thank you that your, this faith is available to us today. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for this church. I pray that it will continue to be an ever brightening light in this area and that people will come to know you as their savior because of it the things i pray in your holy name amen amen, amen. that was one of the best versions of david thank you paul <laughs> All right, remember we're going to sing him 216 great is thy faithfulness 216 <laughs> Amen.
Thank mm-hmm. you.